started. Um, <laughs> so today uh, we have uh, E.J. Chichilnitsky as a speaker, and uh, I will just say a few words of introduction. Probably everyone at Stanford knows you, uh, but uh, still, I just uh, just in case, I'll say that uh, E.J. studied uh, mathematics as an undergraduate degree in Princeton, and then did a master degree in mathematics and PhD in neuroscience at Stanford and the Brian Vandell, if I'm not mistaken. And then worked for 15 years in Salt uh, Institute in San Diego before moving back to Stanford in 2013. Uh, EJ studies uh, neural uh, circuits and retina, uh, retinal code, basically of encoding visual information by retinal cells. And uh, lately he is uh, uh, drifting towards more and more of engineering uh, related to retina, in particular, with an idea of replacing retinal circuits altogether in cases of retinal generation and reintroducing properly coded uh, visual inputs into the ganglion cell, the output layer of retina, uh, to deliver it to the brain properly encoded so the brain wouldn't even know that there is different retina there. Uh, this is very different from the approach I presented a year ago that we are pursuing, where we just replace lost photoreceptors in this retinal generation and still utilize retinal circuitry to whatever extent possible. And as you know, we have a debate with EJ for years which approach is better. And uh, it's going to win out eventually. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So far, we have excellent clinical data, but uh, uh, I will be happy to see, you know, what can be done. And I think it actually can be extended even beyond retina. Maybe you can talk about that. Uh, so knowing the retinal code, you know, being able to deliver it, to read and write, is, it has benefits even beyond artificial retina. So let's uh, welcome EJ and let us uh, let you tell us uh, what the uh, you know, problem is. Thank you, Daniel. That is a super nice introduction. Does anybody have trouble hearing me speaking like this? Okay, our audio in this room is not perfect, so I'm just going to speak loudly and, you know, wave your hands if you can't hear me at some time. So, um, thank you, Daniel, not only for the nice introduction, but also for running the seminar series. It's awesome to be here with my many colleagues, uh, long-term collaborators, great friends, and even family members here. So, uh, it's, a, it's a privilege, really, to be here. So I'm going to tell you about our approach to a problem which is illustrated here, which is incurable blindness um, that millions of people suffer from. Um, obviously, there are great technologies for dealing with incurable blindness and, for example, navigating. And nowadays, there are even better technologies for that with various kinds of smart assistive devices. Nonetheless, blindness is obviously a condition that has a huge impact on your life. And we kind of know that because most of us have very limited experience dealing with blind people or having them in our daily lives. They live in a kind of separate world. So the question is, in the context of neural interfaces, is there something that one can do in terms of building devices that interface to the nervous system to approach this problem? Well, many forms of blindness come about because of degeneration of the retina. The retina, of course, is the tissue at the rear of the eye that captures the incoming light, transforms that light into electrical signals, processes those signals, and then sends the visual information up to the brain where it's assembled for visual perception. Can we build devices that interface to or replace the function of the circuitry? Now, one concept for that is illustrated in the, in the next slide, where it shows a little bit more detail about the eye and the retina. So normally, the external world is imaged onto the surface of the retina by the optics of the eye. The retina schematically is indicated down here with the photoreceptors in the rear that capture the light. The light actually comes through the mostly transparent retina and is captured by the photoreceptors. The signals from the photoreceptors are then processed by an extensive network inside the retina. And finally, the output neurons of the retina, the so-called retinal ganglion cells, transmit visual information to the brain in patterns of electrical activity, nerve impulses or spikes, these all or none spikes that are sent to various targets in the brain. Now, so that's the normal function of the retinal circuitry. And I won't use a lot of jargon in my talk today, but this term, retinal ganglion cells, will be one of the most important terms I'll use today. So please hang on to that. These are the output neurons of the retina that send the signals to, to the brain. Now, in many forms of uh, vision loss, particularly age-related macular degeneration and also a less common one called retinitis pigmentosa, the photoreceptor cells are lost to disease. 
So this means you can no longer convert the visual image into the pixels that, are, that represent it, which is the photoreceptors, and so, of course, you become blind. So is there an opportunity for a technological intervention? Well, an obvious concept for that is illustrated here, where you might have a camera that captures the visual image in replacing the photoreceptors, circuitry that processes the signals coming out of the camera, and electrodes that electrically stimulate the remaining ganglion cells, causing them to send artificial visual signals to the brain. So if we could construct this device in a way that mimics the signals that are normally sent to the brain, in principle, we could replace the function of the retina and restore high quality vision. Now, we're definitely not the first people to think of this. This idea has been around for decades. Not only that, some people have actually built such devices. The first major device like this is one created by a company called Second Sight. And uh, without going into too much detail, there's a camera mounted on a pair of goggles that's then processed by this quaint looking video processing unit that communicates wirelessly with electronics that are mounted on the outside of the eye that are then connected to an electrode array on the inside of the eye. A picture of the electrode array is shown here with 60, 60 electrodes mounted on the surface of the retina that electrically stimulates the neurons on the retina. So the great news about this kind of device is that it can provide some kind of visual restoration. People who have these devices uh, report seeing flashes of light when you stimulate electrodes. And not only that, they're in some kind of crude correspondence with the external world in, the, in, this, in this device. Unfortunately, that's the good news. The, the bad news is the function is very crude, very limited, to the degree that nobody with one of these devices would ever give up their guide dog or their cane in favor of one of the devices. A nice summary of how these devices work is given here by uh, an article in the New York Times on the day that it, was, it came out for, uh, it became legal to sell it in the United States. With it, people with certain types of blindness can detect crosswalks on the street, burners on a stove, the presence of people or cars, and sometimes even oversized numbers or letters. One way to summarize, is, summarize it is that there are very crude, irregular shapes that people perceive that are somehow related to the outside world. You might be able to tell there's a crosswalk here, not there but you can't see any detail of it. So it's nothing like what we think of as normal visual experience, where we can recognize objects, navigate complex new environments, inspect detail in objects, even appreciate beauty. So, so that's the situation with the, the first pass technology, the first generation technology. Now, what can be done to make these devices better? Well, an obvious thing that you might be thinking is, well, this doesn't sound very good to have just 60 electrodes on the surface of the retina. That's a very small number of electrodes. You're not going to be able to create a great visual image with that. And people are working on that. In fact, the leader in the world working on that is sitting in the front of the room, Daniel Palanker, who has developed a technology that he spoke about last year, shown here, that has many more electrodes, much more densely packed, and also has benefits of wireless, modular, and high-resolution stimulation. And I'm not going to repeat the wonderful work that Daniel has done, um, but just to tell you that it's in clinical trials now, and it's very interesting. Okay, so that's great. There's improvements in technology being made and higher density stimulation, more electrodes, and so on, which is definitely something you need, as well as these other benefits. But there's still a problem. And the problem that remains, I like to illustrate this way. The problem is that the retina is not a camera. Okay, so what's a camera? A camera is a device that takes a visual image and then ideally renders it into a representation that, if it's working well, has pixels that correspond one for one with the external device, uh, with external image. That's great. So the retina doesn't do that. What the retina does is takes the visual image and transforms it into these patterns of action potentials over time, these digital impulses that are transmitted down a number of optic nerve fibers to a number of different targets in the brain. And these signals, these action potentials, don't correspond one for one with the pixels in the image. It's quite different from that, and I'm going to tell you something about that in the next few minutes. This comes about because the retinal circuitry is actually nothing like a simple pixel detector. It's much more complex than that. And the retinal circuitry is illustrated here. Uh, on the left, a cross-section of the actual retina, and on the right, a schematic of the different cell types in the retina. The photoreceptors are here, the interneurons that process the image are here, and the retinal ganglion cells are down here. What I hope you can appreciate is the exquisite beauty of the retina and its highly structured organization. In particular, what I want you to appreciate is that there are many different cell types in the retinal circuitry. Upwards of 40, probably more like 60 or so cell types within the retinal circuitry that do perform different functions and about 20 different ganglion cell types, the output neurons of the retina that send the visual information to the brain. 
Now, these 20 different ganglion cell types are very different from one another. They differ in terms of their morphology, their shapes and sizes. They differ in terms of which retinal interneurons they connect to by virtue of a very precise addressing scheme in this layer of synapses. They differ in terms of their light response properties as far as we know them. And they differ in terms of their distinct patterns of projection in the brain. Not only that, but each of the different ganglion cell types sends a distinct visual representation to its particular set of central targets. So not only is the retina not a camera or a pixel detector, it's, it's more complex than that, but in addition to that, it's not just a neural circuit. It's like 20 different neural circuits that are tightly interleaved that perform 20 or so different functions and send the results to a number of different targets in the brain. So given that this is the reality of the retina, what does it mean to reproduce the neural signals in the retina accurately? What's required to do that? What is needed to interface effectively with this precise and specific circuitry? Well, first we have to understand it and building on the decades of research on the retina that many laboratories have performed, I'm gonna tell you about some of our studies that sort of summarize the state of the art and how we understand the retinal circuitry. So in the next few minutes, I'll tell you our basic understanding of how it normally works. That'll lead us to how we need to reproduce its activity. So first we have to think about animal models and a number of different animal models have been used to study the function of the retina over time. This one because of high acuity vision, this one because it turns out to be easy to work with. This one, I don't have to tell you why, but I can, I can assure you it's not because of its high acuity vision. It's because of our ability to manipulate the genome of this animal. We don't study any of those in my lab. We study the macaque monkey retina. We do this because the macaque monkey has a retina and a visual system that are extremely similar to our own. Indeed, the retina can be identified very closely with the human retina in terms of the gross morphology, the shapes and sizes, the different cell types, the patterns of projection in the brain, and so on. It's really an exquisitely similar system and by far the most relevant target for understanding human vision. We study the macaque retina by obtaining eyes from laboratories using macaque monkeys and in the course of their research at times, killing the animal at the end of the experiment. At that time, we take the eyes, bring them back to our laboratory and are able to keep them alive for about two days and perform electrophysiological recordings from those eyes. We do this using a preparation shown here, where briefly a piece of retina is placed flat against an electrode array of, of 512 electrodes. These electrodes are small, about 10 microns in diameter and separated by distances of 30 to 60 micrometers. The retina is, is kept in a chamber and superfused with an oxygenated saline solution to keep it alive and happy for many hours and stimulated with the op optical, optically reduced image of a computer display. So it's a cool setup because we can deliver the natural visual stimulus to the retina while recording its natural patterns of activity to understand its functionality. The specific techniques that we use to do this are illustrated in this slide, large scale re electrical recording with 512 electrode arrays that are very dense, somewhat dense and a bit less dense, 30, 60 and 120 micron separation. Shown below is the custom analog VLSI circuitry that's used to amplify, filter and multiplex these signals. This entire system was developed in close collaboration with my colleague, Alan Litke, who's here in the audience. Over, over the years that has allowed us to perform a number of different recordings that, as I said, summarize the state of the art and our understanding of how the retina works. Now, I'll briefly mention that when we perform these recordings, we obtain many signals from many neurons over time. We have to make sense of these voltage recordings, the spikes that are detected, figure out which ones came from which cells and so on. That's not trivial, but there's not enough time for me to go into it and explain it in detail. I'll ask you to trust me that we are able to identify individual spikes from individual cells and separate them out from one another. To then understand what the different light response properties of the cells are that we're recording, we typically use a so-called white noise visual stimulus, which turns out to be a very uh, simple and uh, unbiased way to characterize light response properties of cells in a recording. We present this visual stimulus for tens of minutes, record the spikes from each and every cell in our recording, and then reverse correlate the spike train with this visual image. In other words, we figure out what's the average stimulus on the display prior to a spike in this cell. What that looks like is a little movie shown on the right. It tells you on average what was happening on the display when this cell spiked. And it looks like this. What you can see is that shortly before, before the occurrence of a spike in this particular cell, there was a brightening in this particular region of the display. We characterize that using the, the, the term receptive field, which is a term from neuroscience indicating the light responsive region of the cell in visual space. And we can also obtain quantitative information about the time course and chromatic properties of the light response from this. It's a simple summary of the properties, the light response properties of the cell. 
What's great about this technique is that combined with the large scale recording, we can actually separate out the different cell types that we see in a single recording very easily and very quickly. We do this by first looking at the collection of receptive fields that we record in a given recording, shown here superimposed on the large scale electrode array. What you see is many different cells with many different receptive fields all recorded simultaneously. So that's good. The bad side is this looks like a total mess. And I was telling you how precise and beautiful the retinal circuitry is. Why is that? Well, that's because we're mixing up the different cell types here. But it turns out we can pick apart the different cell types by looking at quantitative properties of their light response, such as the size of the receptive field, the strength of the light response, and other properties that we can characterize. And the important point, without going into the detail here, is just to show you that the different cells recorded fall into very distinct clusters, easily separable from one another, once we're quantitative about their light response properties. And most importantly, if we look at these different clusters, which basically tell us there's this cell group and a different cell group and a different cell group and a different cell group, what we see is that their receptive fields tile the region of retina recorded in a very neat, orderly, and precise way, unlike the spaghetti mess that we see in the middle. That's important because we know from decades of anatomical studies that the individual cell types cover the surface of the retina with their dendritic fields. So the observation that the different cell groups identified here tile the surface of the retina in the same way tells us that these must correspond to the distinct cell types in the retina. This, was, this picture is from a while back, but um, what I want to tell you is that we have advanced our understanding of the different cell types. This is four out of the 20 cell types, the numerically dominant four cell types, so-called on and off parasol and on and off midget ganglion cells. Those are anatomical names. But over time, we've gotten better and better in doing this, and now we have, we're able to routinely record and identify seven different cell types, which collectively form about 80% of the entire visual representation transmitted to the brain. In addition to precise information about the locations of these cells, how they're distributed over space, we also see the time courses of the light response and also can measure statistical properties of the firing of the cells, their spike train temporal properties, and I'm not going to go into gory detail. I just want you to see that we're able to obtain a very complete quantitative understanding of the light response properties of these cells. Okay, so that's the story. Many different cell types, very beautifully, precisely laid out, very distinct light response properties from one another. And the implications are very important for thinking about how to reproduce the visual signal. And that is that these distinctions between these different cell types manifest in totally different signals that are sent to the brain. We can see that by playing a particular stimulus. In this case, a stimulus that goes bright and then a little bit darker and then a little bit darker and then back up here, shown here by the grayscales and recording the spikes from a particular cell of one of the types, an on-parasol cell, shown here. Each tick here is, represents the time of a spike during this recording. Each row represents a new presentation of this visual stimulus that's going up and down. And what you see is that this cell fires at a particular point after this increase in intensity and then also after this increase in intensity. Okay, great. That's what that cell does. That's the signal that cell sends to the brain. Cool. Now we go to another on-parasol cell in the same retina recorded at the same time, just its neighbor, a couple of cells over, and we see an almost identical property. So these cells are very precise. Those precise images that I showed you are reflected in the signals that are sent to the brain, the time precision of those signals. If we then go to a different cell type, in this case a so-called off-parasol cell, it couldn't be more different. It fires at really completely different set of times. And another off-parasol cell exactly like this one, little carbon copy, and so on as we march through the major cell types in the retina, each one is sending a distinct piece of information to its particular set of central targets. As you might imagine, over the years, we've been able to accumulate good computational models that can predict what these different cell types do. And without going into gory detail, the models look something like this with linear filters, nonlinearities, stochastic spike generation, and some feedback to capture more about the nonlinearities. Please don't get bogged down here. It's just to show you that we do this kind of modeling work. And we can typically reproduce those rasters of light response quite accurately in many conditions. So we have a good description of the cells. We can see they're very distinct from one another. It leads us to this picture of how the retina works. We have multiple different cell types laid out beautifully and regularly over space, firing at different times, sending different signals to their particular set of central targets. That's the story that emerges from all this work. Okay, so what we'd like to do to replace retinal function then is to mimic these patterns of activity as accurately as we could. Great. The problem is the different cell types aren't laid out for us in these distinct sheets from one another. In fact, they're all mixed up on the surface of the retinal circuitry. So if you walk in with an electrode array, as all current retinal interfaces are built, that knows nothing about the cell types or where they are, and you just stick the grid in there and start stimulating the electrodes in the grid formation in relation to the image, 
you're not going to produce these distinct patterns of activity in these different cell types. You can't. You don't know which cell is which. You don't know which cell to stimulate. You're just producing local patterns of activity. So this is where it comes down to the retina is not a pixel detector. It's not a camera. It's doing this, and we're doing this. So that's the problem. And I like to, to use a, a metaphor, which is uh, an orchestra, which has distinct instruments that have distinct scores that they play in this ensemble that we call music. Now, if you try to conduct this orchestra and give the instruments all the same score and treat them as all the same, you can do something. You might even be able to carry a tune that's not bad, but you're not going to reproduce the music that we would like to reproduce. So the implications of this are extreme. If you want to, because all those different cell types are all mixed up with one another in the retinal circuitry, if you want to actually try to reproduce those signals, unfortunately, there's only one solution, which is to achieve something like single cell resolution. You've got to be able to pick out each cell and avoid its neighbors in order to reproduce the patterns of activity. Can you do that? Well, nobody's ever built an interface that does that. So I'm going to tell you in the next few minutes about our steps toward doing that. So we do this in the same configuration that I showed you before with the same technology collaborators that are absolutely essential for all of this. We pass current through the individual electrodes while recording the activity from many electrodes simultaneously. So that's our basic plan. And our current, current pulses that we pass are um, very simple, uh, brief, sort of 0.1 millisecond triphasic or biphasic current pulses that are charge balanced and uh, very small currents, about a microamp of current, just enough to tickle a few cells into firing spikes, which I'll show you in a second. Okay, so that's the experimental paradigm. And now let me show you what the data look like to, because it illustrates what, what we need to do to understand these data. So here's a case where we pass current at this point in time. Shown in, on this trace is the voltage as a function of time recorded on a single electrode. We pass the current right here, and many traces of voltage are shown, all in the case with passing current. After we pass current, there's a transient in the voltage here that we expect. It's electrical artifact. We pass current while recording. We're going to get some electrical artifact. We try to minimize that, but we get some. Interestingly, after a little period of time, we see that the curves diverge into two groups, this group and this group on different trials. And we call these successes and these failures because if we average these and average these and subtract the two, what we get is an act, a waveform that resembles very closely the waveform of a natural action potential that you expect. Not only that, the waveform of that action potential is a perfect match to the spontaneous activity recorded when we're not stimulating the cell. So what this tells us is that we're able to pick out the spikes from an individual, individual cell by stimulating repetitively and seeing that in this particular current level, the cell fires spikes sometimes and doesn't fire spikes other times. The current levels are low, well within established, safe, established safety limits. So that's, I'm not going to go into that, but that's the, that's the situation. Okay, so we can do this for the five major ganglion cell types that form about 75% of the entire visual signal transmitted to the brain. As we raise the amount of current that we pass up to about 100 picoamps, uh, picocoulombs, excuse me, um, we, we see that the response probability climbs from zero to about one over that particular range. Furthermore, the precision of the timing of the spike that we elicit is, is exquisite. We can typically get the spike nailed down in time to about a tenth of a millisecond, which is much more precise than the natural visual signals. But most importantly, we can often stimulate a single cell to fire a spike with very high probability while not stimulating any of its neighbors. So here, this on parasol cell is made to fire with probability one. Its neighbors don't fire. Similarly for this one, similarly for these other cell types. So you may be thinking, oh, that's cool, but wait a second. If I get this on parasol cell to fire, does one of these cells fire? So that experiment is shown in the next slide. Four different cell types, all recorded simultaneously, separated out for your convenience. In fact, they're on top of one another. We pass current through a particular electrode to activate a particular cell. We're able to get that cell to fire with very high probability, while not activating any of its neighbors of the same type or of the different types. So that's the ideal. This is conducting the orchestra and making one instrument play one note exactly when you want it, okay? If we, were, if we had this in every case, we would be done with the problem of recreating the patterns of activity in the retina. We're not done. It's not that simple, and now I'm going to start telling you about how it's a little bit, it's not always that simple. So in some cases, we'll pass current, we'll activate one cell, but we get a little bit of splatter onto another cell nearby. In some cases, we'll try to target this cell, pass some current, we can get it to fire, but at lower current levels than this one firing, we got this one firing even more. So we get a little bit of splatter. So I want you to think of this as glass half empty, half full again. On the one hand, it's pretty awesome. Sometimes we can just get one cell to fire and nobody else is firing. So we have perfect control of that instrument. But sometimes we get a little bit of splatter onto other instruments. That's the situation. Now, let's just at least take us forward to 
ideally what we could do with this, we don't just want to get one cell to fire, we want to control the whole orchestra, right? We want to make a whole score. Can we do that at all? Well, we want to do that in a way that resembles something like natural vision. Natural vision being something like, let's say, a bar of light moving across your retina, as, a, as the, a moving stimulus would be in your visual field, that creates patterns of activity in a collection of cells. So this is a real pattern of activity in a real collection of on-parasol cells. It would be what you would see in your peripheral retina if you're looking straight and a bus moves over this way, you get a pattern of activity that looks like this in your peripheral retina, okay? We want to be able to reproduce those patterns of activity. Can we do that by carefully manipulating the cells? Well, this is a complex experiment, so we're not able to do it yet at the scale of, of, of dozens or hundreds of cells, but in a very small collection of cells, we're able to do that, as shown in the following. So here, a bar of light moves across the receptive fields of six cells recorded simultaneously. The spikes evoked are shown be below here, occurring at these various times. The bar of light first evokes spikes in cell one, then a little bit later in cells two, three, and four, and then a little bit later in cells five and six, as you expect from their positions. In the experiment, we first pass that bar of light. We figure out the responses as shown here. Then we go and we pass current through each of the different electrodes at many different current levels and figure out which electrodes at which current levels are ideal for activating which cells. Wow. It's, a, it's a lot of calibration that has to occur all at once. Okay, then we go back and we say, can we reproduce those patterns of activity by passing the appropriate amount of current in a selected set of electrodes? So we pass current at these particular times shown by red and the elicited spikes are shown by gray right here. So what this tells us is in this little collection of cells in this particular retina, we're able to reproduce the patterns of activity with exquisite precision. It's a very faithful representation of the original neural code of a moving bar. So in the best case, this is what happens. And although sometimes we have, we miss a cell here, or there, that, that kind of stuff happens too in the peripheral retina. Okay, one other problem. And this problem is illustrated in this slide, which I find at the same time beautiful and horrifying. Uh, it's hopefully beautiful to you, but it's, for me it's horrifying because these are the axons running across the surface of the retina. And of course, when you have an electrode ray and you put it on top of the retina like this and you pass current, there's every possibility that when you pass current through that electrode right there, you're going to activate these many axons. These are, the, these are the, the wires, if you will, that carry the neural signal from the retina to the brain. If you put an electrode right on top of the wires and pass current, you're going to activate a whole bunch of cells in a very nonspecific way, basically making a mess out of the neural code. That does happen, and I'll show you that next. It happens quite a bit, and the issue is how do you avoid it? How do you deal with that? And when I came to Stanford, that was the biggest thing on our, on our radar. So let me tell you how we went about trying to understand that. So first, I want you to, to give you an indication of what it looks like to see a single cell firing, okay? That's gonna be crucial for this. So let me take you through that by going back for a moment to simply light evoked spikes in a cell. No electrical stimulation right now. And that's illustrated here. So here's light evoked to spikes in the cell. Here's the electrode array. Here's a particular electrode. Here's the voltage recorded on that electrode. These are the spikes recorded on that electrode. We identify the spike times here. Great, we got that, got that cell down. We understand something about that cell firing on that electrode. Now, what about these other electrodes? What happens when the cell fires? When, what, what do you record on these electrodes? Well, here are the traces from these other electrodes. You don't see much. You don't see much here or here. It's kind of buried in the noise. So you don't really know what's going on in the other electrodes in the cell fires. But there's a trick that, that you can use, which is time averaging. You have many spikes in this particular cell. You have maybe 10,000 spikes that you recorded from this cell. And what you can do is average over the different spikes that you recorded. In each of those time windows, you get a, a little snippet from here, a snippet from here, and average those. And what you do if you average thousands of those is you get these nice little waveforms that are very clear that are basically averaging away the noise. And it tells you what's going on in those electrodes on average when that cell fires a spike. What you can see is that there's a much smaller signal as expected than what's on this major electrode, but it has interesting waveforms. This waveform is opposite of the spike waveforms. They're strongly suggestive of the dendrites of a neuron that provide a current source for the sink at the cell. This triphasic potential is strongly suggestive of, a, of an axon that travels past. And here on this electrode number four, we don't see anything at all. It's really not recording anything from that cell. But it's all really revealed when you look at the space-time movie shown here. This is a one millisecond movie. It'll illustrate that the cell is here. It fires a spike. There's, per there's stuff happening around in the cell body and the dendrites of the cell. And then, it, then the signal projects down this axon to the brain. This is what allows us to figure out what's going on with axon stimulation. And we'll show that in the next slide. So now let me go to electrical stimulation again. 
I'm going to show you what happens when we pass current through a particular electrode and see what happens on the electrode array. So now we're stimulating electrically, okay? And what you'll see is a single cell firing a spike. It'll start here and it'll propagate down here. But first you'll see a big flash, which is the electrical artifact. So here we go. Pass current, big flash, artifact, and the signal propagates down. Let me just do that again for you. Pass current, flash, and then signal propagates down. That turns out to be one cell. And we know that because we can, we can establish the correspondence between that and the spontaneous activity of the cell separately that has exactly that space-time pattern. If we pass a little more current, so this is 1.5 microamps of current passed through this electrode. If we pass two microamps of current through this electrode, we get a totally different pattern shown here, which is very disturbing. It's bi-directional propagation. So here we pass current, big flash, and propagation both that way and that way in a much stronger signal. What that means is that we're activating passing axon. It's a bigger signal, it propagates both directions, that's bad. That means we have recruited a whole bunch of cells whose axons pass over that region and we're messing up the neural code. In this example, the situation is totally cool though. If we just pass 1.5 microamps of current, we get one cell. If we pass two microamps of current, we get a mess. So what we have to do is don't pass two microamps of current, pass 1.5 microamps of current, right? We have to calibrate our system to not do that. Can we do that always? No, in many electrodes we can't because they sit, we think, because they sit too close to a collection of axons, um, but in many cases we can. And an example shown here. So here are the thresholds for current stimulation in histograms from three different retinas for the cell bodies and for the axon bundles passing over them. You can see those thresholds for stimulation are very similar, so it's tricky, this is very tricky. But if we plot one versus the other on a per electrode basis, what we see is that sometimes the threshold of the cell body is higher than the axon, that's bad. But sometimes the threshold of the cell body is lower than the axon, that's good. So if we pick out those cases where one is firing and not the other, we can bias ourselves toward getting somatic stimulation without all those axons. Okay, so that tells us the story then of like where we sit with all this. We wanted to reproduce this neural code. We have this set of electrodes. If we make them fine enough and small enough and we stimulate and we record, what we learn is that we can often stimulate an individual cell. Sometimes we get a little bit of splatter onto another cell. Sometimes we get an axon recruited. But if we're careful and we record and stimulate and calibrate, we can avoid this mess that we don't wanna have. And we can, we can create the code very precisely in some of the cells, okay? So it's not perfect, but it's not bad. Glass half empty, half full. Okay, so in that situation now, imagine yourself conducting the orchestra. You can get this violin, that one, you might get some cello, that you can get that violin over there, that one, you might get some other instrument that you don't wanna get. And the question is, when an image comes in, what do you want to do to, to, what do you want to do to make the music as good as possible? And this brings back on the table something we've left off the table, which is image encoding. Once we implant this device, we have complete freedom to decide how that image maps onto the pattern of stimulation of which electrodes. And we've calibrated this thing to within an inch of its life, so we understand what it's doing, which cells are being activated, when, and all that kind of stuff. So the question is, how do you decide what to do with the, with the image coming in, which electrodes are you gonna stimulate given that it's good but not perfect? All right, so let's think about that problem. What do you wanna do? Well, what you wanna do actually is this, I'm gonna switch gears on you by saying, well, I actually don't care that much about the particular pattern of activity. What I care about is that. I care about what the person sees. That's my objective function, if you will. I'm gonna switch the objective function out from under you. Instead of being this, it's this. I wanna make them see the right thing. Now, you can't get a person to describe to you every pixel in an image. You can't do that in terms of just getting feedback from the human being. So how can we think about this problem of reproducing the correct perception? Okay, so the way we think about that problem is to make one big assumption. It's definitely an assumption. It's definitely wrong in detail, but I don't think it's a ridiculous place to start. We can discuss that in the question and answer if appropriate. The assumption we're gonna make is that here's how the brain works when it's receiving retinal input. It does its best to estimate the image. It takes that retinal input and makes as faithful an estimate of the outside image as it can with this retinal input that's coming down the pipes. It's kind of an evolutionary type assumption. It's doing a good job of estimating the image. Optimal reconstruction is what we're gonna assume, okay? And we can discuss variations on this assumption later, but we're gonna, see, we're gonna first see how far it takes us, which is actually pretty far. Okay, so optimal reconstruction. So 
that's what we want to think about. If the brain does that, then can we use that to somehow get into this mode where we can get into this image encoding domain and turn the knobs on our device to make the image as good as we can get it? Well, to do that, we want to make this quantitative. We want to basically figure out what that optimal reconstruction would be. Okay, how are we going to do that? Well, we start with the images and the experiments. We, pass, we present many different images to the retina and we record many spikes from many cells in many experiments, lots and lots and lots of experiments. And we say, look, this is the normal encoding. And the question is, what would, a, what would, it be, uh, what would be a computation, a calculation that takes you from here back to here? It's kind of inverting the computation based on the, the substantial data we can record. And if we have that, then we can go turn our knobs to optimize things. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we make another big assumption, which is that this reconstruction is linear. That's the typical engineering assumption. It's clearly wrong, but again, it can take us a fair way, and we can discuss how we can improve upon that assumption too, okay? So if we assume that this reconstruction is linear, then the problem becomes straightforward. You write down the stimulus, the response, and, the, and a reconstruction weights. This is the linear estimation problem. I'm not gonna get bogged down in the simple linear algebra. You will, many of you will recognize this, obviously, as the pseudo-inverse, okay? So, what you can do is take this large data set with many images presented, many spikes recorded, and figure out what a smart brain would do. So we now have a matrix, a linear inverse, that's a surrogate for the brain. It's got entries, we wrote the thing down, this is what we think the brain is doing under these simple assumptions of optimal reconstruction and linearity. And we can improve upon that. But. Okay, so first I wanna show you that this, this reconstruction idea is not totally ridiculous. Does that make any sense at all? Well, we can do that in the experiment by saying, look, we present this image, we see this pattern of activity in two of the cell types, so-called on and off parasol cells, which are the ones we record from most frequently. I'm gonna focus on those two in the next few minutes. We do this kind of linear reconstruction story, and we say, all right, well, what happens is when we do this is that each cell has associated with a set of weights, that is what it communicates about the visual world. This cell communicates that, this cell communicates that, and when you put together the responses of all these cells, the image estimate that you get is this, okay? so. We can do a reasonable job of taking an image, getting the pattern of activity of the cells, and using that to get our, our estimate of what a smart brain would do with these cells, and it would do that. And that's not bad compared to what you get if you just take these cells and you blur, take the image and blur it a little bit over space. Okay, so we've built this thing, this surrogate brain. It's a matrix that is supposed to represent what the brain does with the incoming visual image. Now that we have that surrogate brain, we say, good, Here, in comes the image, we get to turn the knobs on this thing, and we're turning the knobs so that this reconstruction is as good as possible. Okay, we're almost there. But then two challenges come up. First, calibrating all the stimulation patterns is difficult. Okay, let's just give, to take an example. 512 electrodes, 10 current levels at each electrode. The number of different patterns of activity you can pass through that thing is 10 to the 512. Okay, that's not good. Um, that's probably more than the age of the universe in, you know, in seconds, and so on. So, that, so you can't calibrate every possible stimulation pattern. And the stimulation don't combine linearly with each other down here at the retinal surface, something we've checked. They do a little bit, but then they don't. I'm not going to go into it in detail, but calibrating is hard, okay? So you have to restrict what you calibrate. And so the choices we make is to, is to make a dictionary where we calibrate a subset of patterns, specifically passing current through individual electrodes, one at a time, but we don't do all the combinations because that's way too much, okay? So we have a dictionary approach. The second problem is that once we've done that, if we have this image, you say, okay, well, what am I gonna do? I gotta do it fast because I'm walking through my visual scene. I see this, I see this, I see this. You gotta stimulate really fast. Figuring out what's the best pattern of activity to pass is not trivial at all. So what we do is a very simple optimization approach known as greedy optimization, we pick the best electrical stimuli in a rapid sequence. And we basically just choose one electrode, stimulate something through there, and then the next one stimulate through there, next one stimulate through there. Keep doing this in a rapid sequence and assume that what the brain is doing is integrating all those inputs over a little period of time, like 50 or maybe as long as 500 milliseconds, okay? So the assumption is we can zip around, stimulate individual electrodes, and the brain's gonna add that all together to give rise to our perception. Again, it's a simplifying assumption. It's neither crazy nor perfect, but it's getting us far. And now I'm gonna show you what that kind of thing looks like when we put it all together in an experiment. So here's recordings from a, a collection of on-parasol cells and a collection of off-parasol cells, the two most frequently recorded cell types. Here's our visual stimulus that we wanna recreate in this collection of cells. 
if we had perfect control over every single cell and could make every cell do exactly what we want, the reconstructed image that, that the brain would, pre, would putatively reconstruct would look like this. That's as well as we can do with this collection of cells, okay? That's perfection in this instance. So what we do is this greedy stimulation. We first calibrated everything, we figure out which electrode activates which cell, and then in real time, as we present this image, we go bing, 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 stimulate different electrodes with the correct amount of current to optimize the image, and it looks like this. So this is all very slowed down in time. This is totally, the whole thing is lasting 50 to 500 milliseconds, depending on how you think about it. And what you see is as we do this, the image in the brain that we, that we speculate to be occurring in the brain builds up gradually over time as we march through and, and, and stimulate. And it's not a bad reflection of this image here. This image that with all this work of calibrating, greedy stimulation and all this kind of stuff, it's not bad. What are we gonna compare it to? Well, I'd like to compare it to what we would expect from naive grid stimulation of the type I described to you before, which is how all current retinal interfaces work. And in this case, what you get with grid stimulation looks like this, which is not a helpful representation of the visual image. And the fact that it looks like this, we can explain, but I'm not gonna go into it right now, but let's just say it's not surprising that it's way worse because again, we're not doing anything correct with respect to these different cell types in the grid stimulation. By the way, this isn't true retinal prostheses, including the one that, that uh, that Daniel has developed, they don't look this bad. They look better than this. So that's something to discuss too. But we think this is gonna be way better and we can discuss that, okay? So let me just give you a little quantitative look at this. Uh, we, we develop a target like this. The, in another collection, collection of cells, we say the best reconstruction we could do is that. The optimal, if we had the optimal algorithm, the smartest possible algorithm, we could wait a whole long time to compute the right thing. We would get that pattern, which is not bad approximation. The greedy algorithm I just described to you does quite well compared to that. Very close match, and again, the grid stimulation is not good. Quantitatively, we can summarize the normalized mean square error. Down here is shown the error associated with perfect control. The green bars indicate um, grid stimulation. And in the middle are both algorithms and, and both algorithms on top of one another about two thirds of the way over. So in summary, by using this greedy dictionary based stimulation, we can optimize how we stimulate this collection of cells that are rather well, but not perfectly controlled. In that situation, we can create a rather good visual image, which is a lot better than what you expect from a grid naive stimulation. Okay. So, let me, um, let me wrap up and tell you uh, what I think are the important, some of the important points for the future, both for the development of this technology and for other implications. So first, let me tell you about what conclusion. So I, I argued to you at the beginning that the signals in the natural retinal circuitry are very specific, very precise, and they're cell type specific. Different cell types sending different types of information to different targets in the brain. We don't understand how all that works in the brain, but we do know the signals are really different. And we think we have to reproduce those to get a high functioning retinal prosthesis. We found that fine grained electrical stimulation can match this precision in some cases. And we can discuss more about what are the cases and where it fails and stuff like that. But what you saw is that in some cases we can get an individual cell to fire an individual spike with sub millisecond time resolution, which is as good as you can hope for. And in other cases it breaks down and we can calibrate that and know when it's working and when it's not working and how much. We find that axon activation is a significant problem and that's been observed in previous devices that were implanted. But again, we can calibrate that. We can see by propagation of the signal across the electrode array when an axon is stimulated and when it's not. And we can avoid the situations when it's not and use the situations when, avoid situations when it's stimulated and use the situations when it's not. And finally, if we're, if we, if we summarize the problem of trying to reproduce a visual signal, we can develop uh, an encoding algorithm that approaches the best possible algorithm in terms of what you could hope to reproduce with the interface that you've developed that connects up to the retina. I won't talk about two other aspects uh, today, but they may come up in questions. So based on all this work, so this is all work in the lab, in my lab, electrophysiology, electrode array, retina on top of the electrode array, that's what we do. Um, the question is, can we translate that into a device that's implanted in a human and does something like what we're talking about? And the design we have, and, and so that's what we're trying to do. And what I'll introduce to you just briefly now is the Stanford Artificial Retina Project. 
This is a project that, that is a collaboration of many people here at Stanford and other institutions as well, and I'll introduce those people at the end, um, trying to develop a, a device that does this. And the key point about all this is that the device needs to be smart and bidirectional. It needs to read the electrical activity that's there to figure out where are the cells and where are the cell types, the way we do in the lab. It needs to stimulate and then record to figure out which electrodes are activating which cells with what current levels. And then you need to, in an intelligent way, use that calibration information to properly encode the image in real time. And those are the three steps, record, stimulate and record, and then deliver optimal real time stimulation. The overall design of the device is shown here. It has components that I won't go into in great detail. We have to measure the image that's coming in. We have to measure the position of the eye so that the, the position of the eye and the image that it's pointing to are in correct register. The device will communicate with a relay that's mounted on the surface of the retina, then it then communicates with an interface that's pressed up against the surface of the retina. And the technologies for that are being worked out and there's a whole, whole lot going on with that that I don't have time to talk about, but I'll have to be happy to um, answer questions about it. So now I just wanna point out where this architecture and this development, where I think the implications, um, what, what I think the implications are in, in the longer term. So obviously we're motivated at the outset by blindness and by creating devices that can treat incurable blindness. But if we succeed in that or succeed to a pretty good degree in that, there's more available to us. Recall that what we've done is to take control of the signal in a very precise way. Basically every cell and every spike in a region knowing who's who, knowing what signals are supposed to carry, stimulating the ones at, at will to create the pattern we want. Given that, a device like this en enables other things than replacing vision in those who have lost vision. One thing it enables is, the, is a scientific instrument which you could implant in animals and see, first of all, how does the visual system work when you control these different cell types to do different things? It gives you a whole bunch of knobs to turn experimentally that we simply can't with visual stimulation because we have full control of our, over all different cell types and what they're doing at different points of time. So it creates a, it has the potential to create a spectacular research instrument, which we're actually moving toward doing. In addition, once you create this, not only can you think about how does the visual system work, but you can ask the question, if I have such control over the different cell types, could I augment vision? Could I create patterns of activity that deliver more visual signals in some sense to the brain than what they normally do? Could I hijack those pipes, if you will, and deliver more information or different information from what's coming in visually? Opens up the whole world of thinking about this aspect of brain interface. And while we speak of brain interface, um, I just wanna say that if you're, if you're uh, if you make a mistake and type brain interface into your browser, unfortunately what you see is this, okay? And I'm not gonna encourage you to do that. Um, but it's, but it's, it's a joke and it's not a joke because we all know that brain, that the reason we're all here is because we're all interested in neural interfaces and there are so many different brain interfaces being made now, brain interfaces that exist now, such as DBS for Parkinsonism and so on. You know, this is the brave new world. This is what's going on next. I think that the, what the technology we're developing has the potential to have a big impact here. And the reason I think that is because although the retina is its own particular circuit that I've been telling you about, and it's not the same thing as being embedded deep in the brain, actually the fundamental problems are very, very similar. And you can kind of appreciate that just by looking at the retinal circuitry. When you look at the retinal circuitry, there are many cell types. They have different forms of cells with different layering that connect up to different cells in the, in, within the retinal circuitry. It's very detailed. I'm not going to go into it. But this is what the retinal circuitry looks like. And if you go into the brain, the brain, in this case, the visual cortex, it's kind of the same story. Many different cell types, multiple layered structure, computations going on through these layers by these different cell types that are all mixed up with one another. And you somehow have to connect up to this com complex structure. And if you just hit it with a grid of electrodes, the outcome's not gonna be good. So the, uh, the, the premise is that by developing these things in the retina, where we know now what we need to do, we know what the cell types are. We know what the signals normally are. We can do all this stuff. We can actually identify those cell types. We are setting the stage for doing similar things in the future in the brain. So I wanna just end by uh, with the most important slide, which is my collaborators here at Stanford, the Stanford Artificial Retina team. Um, the collaborations with electrical engineers, as well as our retinal surgeon, others at other institutions who I won't mention, and I don't have time to go into describing everybody's role here, as well as our important collaborators and other people we've worked with over the years. Um, 
as well as our funding agencies. I just, I do want to say, however, that um, for me, the, the joy of doing all this is working here at Stanford with this fantastic group of people. I've been absolutely privileged to begin this, this venture with them. So I will be glad to take your questions now. Thanks. Thinking about questions, I will plug in that uh, we uh, plan to organize a debate with the day about the watches we heard with you, and our referrals about different problems. We see them very differently, uh, and our England isn't human, so we actually now see the reality also what patients see, and they see much better than these predictions. And uh, we can discuss why. So there will be a debate, and we hope to have it actually Greek style in Togas. <laughs> and uh, so EJ is uh, working on organizing it, uh, and hopefully we'll announce it soon. So please come over to hear both sides, and it should be interesting. So, any questions? Yes. Oh. How much plasticity is there in the uh, retinal neural circuitry and in the brain that can adapt to uh, learn how to visualize? The, probably the biggest question, that's probably the biggest question in the field. How much plasticity is there? So one thing you could imagine, for example, is that there's so much plasticity that even if you go in, you create a completely wrong code, the brain is so clever that it just figures it out and does it. And that, some of that may occur. And indeed, a little bit of that is known to occur. For example, it's known that if you have retinal detachments and the, and the retina gets replaced and the world's a little bit visually distorted, over time your brain slightly adjusts the spatial uh, layout of things to fix that distortion. And plus, there are many instances that show plasticity in the brain. Indeed, all the current implants rely on a huge degree of brain plasticity. And the real question is, well, how much is there? And if it's this bad in terms of reproducing the neural code, is that going to be good enough? That's the big question. Okay? So now let me tell you why I think that's going to hit a wall pretty quickly, quite possibly with Daniel's technology, because his technology is so good in so many different ways that it's going to run right up against the question of, well, if you don't pay attention to cell types, this is probably about the best thing you can do What's left? Okay, so here's here's what here's some of the things that I think are worth considering. First of all, plasticity is expensive. If you build an electronic circuit or anything, and you want it to be plastic, you want it to be modifiable. First, you have to put in the elements that are modifiable. That's different. That's typically harder than just having a straight up wire. You need a potentiometer. Okay. Second, you need a regulatory mechanism to control the potentiometer. Because if you don't control the thing and it's wiggling all over the place, you make a mess. Okay? So that's in the electronic circuits done. The same thing is true in, in neural circuitry. The plastic, plasticity mechanisms themselves and the control of them are non-trivial and complex. Good. But what does that mean? That means you won't, evolution won't do that. It won't create a form of plasticity unless it's useful. That's a hypothesis. I don't think that evolution had a strong motivation to create a form of plasticity that would deal with the artificial neural code that we are producing with current devices. It's just not something I don't think is something that ever happened in evolution. I don't think the brain would dedicate those resources to it. That's hypothetical, all that discussion I just said. In terms of slightly more concrete things, what I can tell you is this. The adult brain is much less plastic. And there's no way that a parasol cell that projects to the magnocellular layer of the LGM is going to retract its axon and send it to the, par the parvocellular layer of the LGN where the midget cells project to, or similarly in the cortex. Okay? There's all this wiring that's set up in the brain. It's not going to pull it back and put it back. That's not going to happen. That's a, you basically guarantee that for you, even though I haven't done the experiment. Okay? But if you consult any developmental neurobiologist, they will agree with me. Now, the question is, are there higher level changes that could occur in the brain that would somehow patch up this situation, even though those wires are not rewired? It's a great open question. And to me, the question will be answered when we do the following experiment, which is to implant in an animal that can report in one form or another image quality, or that can respond to image quality in one form or another, and either use it in simple grid mode, which we can, it's easy to take our device and make it dumber, or use it in smart, calibrated, feedback optimized mode in the way I just described. Same implant, same electrodes, same retina, same animal, same behavior, same trials. Do you see a difference in the encodings? That will be the ultimate answer to, to the debate. At that point, Daniel and I will switch out our toe guys and have a beer together. Whichever one is. <laughs>
So we know the mechanisms of somatic simulation and uh, exotal simulation is different. So is it possible to redesign the geometry of the electrode such that it's most favorable for somatic simulation, but not favorable for exotal simulation, so you get a larger threshold difference? Um, in principle, yes. In practice, so in principle, yes, because the, as, as you just described, the mechanisms and what, what it responds to, like the second derivative over space, what, yes. what it responds to in terms of stimulation is different if it's at the soma and the axon, and, and as you guys are the world experts on these. So a simple version of that is that if you have the axon going by like this, and you have two electrodes on either side of the axon like this, you pass positive current here, negative current here, and it's perfectly balanced, and they're perfectly symmetrical around the axon. In principle, you don't excite that axon, okay? Mm -hmm if everything is, is uh, homogeneous and all that. Well, okay, and we've done some experiments that show, that show some of that effect, okay? So we can see that in our experiments. Not a gigantic effect, but it's there. If you do this compared to this, or this compared to this, you can see a difference. And we would like to use that, and we can throw those entries into our dictionary to get a little bit of optimization. We haven't seen anything that knocks us over the head as being, as being incredible. I mean, so for example, you have the problem that what if the axon is here and your electrodes are here or here? A little bit out of balance, not perfect. So sculpting it so that you can truly do that is something we are interested in. And I think of it now as adding good elements into our dictionary, cleverly chosen elements. We've done some of that with passing current through a single electrode and using the surrounding electrodes as the grounds, okay? Simple current steering, the same as what you guys do in the, in the subvoltaic stuff, same idea, that helps in terms of focusing the current. So yes, there are, two, there are games you can play. Nothing has radically changed the game, but they're all, there's like lots of little helpful games that you can play. And maybe it's because we're not thinking about it right. So I'm, I'm leaving open the idea that there's more to be done. Yvonne. Yeah, great, I really enjoyed it, thank you. Uh, good question. Um, so what you described was essentially you use your patterns of light stimulation in your monkey retina, right? And then you identify that this electrode is contacting a on parasol stuff, for example, right? Yep. And then you use that ground truth to then uh, try to recreate the visual work eventually, right? Yep. But obviously in a blind person, right. uh, you won't have that ground truth. Right. So how are you going to then do it? Like a patient comes right. in eventually. Right. Right. Like, how are you thinking about it? So the answer is the electrical image. Remember how I showed you that picture of the, the I'll, sh I'll just remind you of that picture just to get it concrete. And I'm not going to go into detail, but I want you to see this to remind you. So this is the pattern formed of the electrode array when a particular cell fires a spike. The details of that can help us to identify cell types. They do help us. Um, and you can imagine right off the bat that axon conduction velocity is something you can measure straight off of it. And there are significant axon conduction velocities that differ between cell types. Also the overall size, the amplitude, other aspects that we're still investigating. We don't have it nailed. We can't do 100% classification yet. We're somewhere between 60 and 80%, but we're, we're working our way through it. But that's the key for us. So the idea is we get spontaneous electrical activity from the patient. Use that. That's good. Last question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so forgetting any plasticity, there's a really big assumption that if you uh, reproduce identically the spikes going down the optic nerve, um, whether it comes from a natural or artificial retina, that will create the identical visual experience or conscious experience of vision. I'm wondering, is that a big assumption or is there actually? It's a gigantic assumption. Oh. Thank you for raising that. So we know that, we know that it's not, so when you can think of it as plasticity or you can think of it as degeneration of the downstream circuitry in the retina, that could happen in a blind patient. Retina stops working, downstream circuitry loses its way and you can no longer reconstruct the image. So if you come in and replace it perfectly, it's too late, the stuff's gone. Right? That could happen. We don't really know because we've never really replaced the retinal image very accurately, so open question. What we do know, of course, is that, is that blind patients can see spots of light and can do some stuff with the current existing devices, and that just keeps getting better and better, and Daniel's technology seems to be the best at the moment. It, it is the best at the moment. Um, so there's something intact. There's a lot of patient-to-patient -patient variability, which I suspect has a lot to do with exactly this degeneration of the central pathways in some patients more and other patients less. Don't know, but I suspect it. Um, two things to say about that. One is you may be able to see that. And um, DTI tractography in, in patients 
shows that patients who've been blind for a while have curious differences in the patterns of projection to the brain that you can detect in MRI using diffu diffusion, tensor, excuse me, diffusion tensor imaging, DTI. So it may be that that's a way to figure out which patients have intact central pathways and which patients have non-intact central pathways and decide which patients are good candidates for this kind of thing. So that's one angle. It's like figure it out before you go and plan the patient, whether they have a good likelihood of doing it. A second point to make, and I think this one's really fun, is, yeah, it could be that over time during degeneration, the brain circuitry changed and got messed up. Maybe you can train it back. So how would you train it back? Well, the obvious thing is just to stimulate it with normal stuff. Maybe it'll just come back. Or maybe it's hard for the brain circuitry to come back to where it was. It's gone so far astray that it doesn't know how to get back to where it was. That's where having this precise control can be super interesting. So for example, there, there, there's beautiful work from the lab of Eric Knudsen here at Stanford that showed that plasticity that's lost, um, plasticity that's lost over time in a, as an animal gets older, according to certain kinds of experiments, is still there if you manipulate the signal in just such a way. If you fine tune and delicately change things slowly over time, you may be able to get back a plasticity that you won't get just by restoring the initial signal naturally as it was. In other words, you sort of need to put breadcrumbs down to guide the circuitry back to where it needs to go. With a device like this, it may be that we can do that. This is very futuristic, okay? But if we have that kind of control, can we create patterns of activity that gently and re-entrain and re-teach the circuit, the structure that it ought to have over time? That would be pretty cool if we could do that. Okay, let's thank EJ for